Hatchet, Chapter 7, Part 2 Maybe he could find some better berries. When he came to the gut cherry bushes, he paused. The branches were empty of birds, but still had many berries, and some of those that had been merely red yesterday were now a dark maroon to black, much riper. Maybe he should stay and pick them to save them. But the explosion in the night was still much in his memory, and he decided to go on. Gut cherries were food, but tricky to eat. He needed something better. Another hundred yards up the shore, there was a place where the wind had torn another path. These must have been fierce winds, he thought, to tear up places like this. As they had, as they had the path, as they had the path he had found with the plane when he crashed. Here the trees were not all the way down, but twisted and snapped off halfway up from the ground, so their tops were all down and rotted and gone leaving the snags poking into the sky like broken teeth. It made for tons of dead and dry wood, and he wished once more he could get a fire going. It also made a kind of clearing. With the tops of the trees gone, the sun could get down to the ground, and it was filled with small thorny bushes that were covered with berries. Raspberries. These he knew because there were some raspberry bushes in the park, and he and Terry were always picking and eating them when they biked past. The berries were full and ripe, and he tasted one to find it sweet, and with none of the problems of the gut cherries. Although they did not grow in clusters, there were many of them, and they were easy to pick, and Brian smiled and started eating. Sweet juice, he thought. Oh, they were sweet with just a tiny tang, and he picked and ate and picked and ate and picked and ate and thought that he had never tasted anything so good. Soon, as before, his stomach was full, but now he had some sense and he did not gorge or cram more down. Instead, he picked more and put them in his windbreaker, feeling the morning sun on his back and thinking he was rich, rich with food now, just rich. And he heard a noise to his rear, a slight noise, and he turned and saw the bear. He could do nothing, think nothing. His tongue stained with berry juice stuck to the roof of his mouth and he stared at the bear. It was black with a cinnamon colored noise not 20 feet from, not 20 feet from him and big not huge it was all black fur and huge he had seen one in the zoo in the city once a black bear but it had been from india or somewhere this one was wild and much bigger than the one in the zoo and it was right there right there the sun caught the ends of the hairs along his back Shining black and silky, the bear stood on its hind legs, half up, and studied Brian. Just studied him. Then lowered itself and moved slowly to the left, eating berries as it rolled along, waffling and delicately using its mouth to lift each berry from the stem, and in seconds, it was gone. Gone. And Brian still had not moved. His tongue was stuck to the top of his mouth, the tip halfway out. His eyes were wide and his hands were reaching for a berry. Then he made a low, a sound, a low, mmm. It made no sense. It was just a sound of fear, of disbelief that something that large could have come so close to him without his knowing. It just walked up to him and could have eaten him, and he could have done nothing, nothing. And when the sound was half done, a thing happened to his legs, a thing he had nothing to do with, and they were running in the opposite direction from the bear, back toward the shelter. He would have run all the way in a panic, but after he had gone perhaps 50 yards, his brain took over and slowed and finally stopped him. If the bear had wanted you, his brain said, he would have taken you. It was something to understand, he thought, not something to run away from. The bear was eating berries, not people. The bear made no move to hurt you, to threaten you. It stood to see you better, study you, then went on its way eating berries. It was a big bear, but it did not want you, did not want to cause you harm. And that is the thing to understand here. He turned and looked back at, back at the stand of raspberries. The bear was gone. The birds were singing. He saw nothing that could hurt him. There was no danger here that he could sense, could feel. In the city at night, there was sometimes danger. You could not be in the park at night after dark because of the danger. But here, the bear had looked at him and had moved on, and this filled his thoughts. 
The berries were so good, so good, so sweet and rich, his body was so empty. And the bear had almost indicated that it didn't mind sharing, had just walked from him, and the berries were so good. And, he thought finally, if he did not go back and get the berries, he would have to eat the gut cherries again tonight. That convinced him, and he walked slowly back to the raspberry patch and continued picking for the entire morning, although with great caution. And once, when a squirrel rustled some pine needles at the base of a tree, he nearly jumped out of his skin. About noon, the sun was almost straight overhead. The clouds began to thicken and look dark. In moments, it started to rain, and he took what he had picked and trotted back to the shelter. He had eaten probably two pounds of raspberries and had maybe another three pounds in his jacket rolled in a pouch. He made it to the shelter just as the clouds completely opened and the rain roared down in sheets. Soon, the sand outside was drenched and there were rivulets running down to the lake. But inside, he was dry and snug. He started to put the, the picked berries back in the sorted pile with the gut cherries, but noticed that the raspberries were seeping through the jacket. They were much softer than the gut cherries and apparently were being crushed a bit with their own weight. When he held the jacket up and looked beneath it, he saw a stream of red liquid. He put a finger in it and found it to be sweet and tangy, like pop without the fizz. And he grinned and lay back on the sand, holding the bag up over his face and letting the seepage drip inside his mouth. Outside, the rain poured down, but Brian lay back, drinking syrup from the berries, dry and with the pain almost gone, the stiffness almost gone, his belly full and a good taste in his mouth. For the first time since the crash, he was not thinking of himself or his own life. Brian was wondering if the bear was as surprised as he to find another bean in the berries. Later in the afternoon, as evening came down, he went to the lake and washed the sticky berry juice from his face and hands, then went back to prepare for the night. While he had accepted and understood that the bear did not want to hurt him, it was still much in his thoughts, and as darkness came into the shelter, he took the hatchet out of his belt and put it by his head, his hand on the handle as the day caught up with him and he slept.